Because as I mentioned, I was born in 1982, and that's the year that they say uh, at the Global Footprint Network that we passed overshoot. Mm -hmm. We started using more each year than the Earth could actually create um, back for us, revitalize back for us. And so the studies are in, um, if you look at Graham Turner's, Graham Turner's work from the CSIRO just this last week, he's uh, been in 2008 and then this year has been tracking limits to growth report, business as usual state, uh, the, the track that was that came out with the Club of Rome's report in 1970s, and he's shown that we're right on track for collapse by 2050 in terms of uh, the systems that, that underpin our, our relationships um, as human beings with, with the earth and with each other. So in my opinion, there's no doubt that we're heading in a cataclysmic direction, but there's a perfect storm brewing of the ingredients needed and the bit that's been missing the bit that was missed by the humanitarian movement, by the feminist movement, by uh, the indigenous movements, by human rights movements, by all different sorts of movements over the last 40 or 50 years, was that if you continued with the economic growth imperative, you were missing the point from a complex adaptive systems perspective because economic growth had become uneconomic. The gains made were being outweighed by the detrimental impacts it was having beyond the balance sheets, beyond the headlines, or sometimes in the headlines but without people's ability to see how the things were linked, how violence was linked with economic growth, how social dislocation was linked with economic growth. So getting to the kind of model that I'm exploring at the moment, I'm putting forward the idea that every business around the world can and probably will need to transition to not-for-profit. Now, most people think of not-for-profit, and, and in the U.S. in particular, uh, they think non-profit because that's the, the legal structure there, and they think non-profit or not-for-profit means no profit. Well, in fact, not-for-profits can make as much profit as they want uh, in countries like Australia and elsewhere. It's just that that profit can't be redistributed to private shareholders or individuals. I think that's the bit that got missed in the economic model in the last 50 years, you know, with the end of history and neoliberalism and the rollout. The conversation turned around socialist policies versus neoliberal policies on the spectrum. And both of those, throughout history in the Cold War, for example, profit was still the driver, especially in the way that it rolled out in terms of the privatisation of profit. Even if the state was supposedly the, the, uh, the mechanism... Um, industrial production, etc., the state was still privatizing profit in the process. Certain people were getting wealthy um, in, in the Soviet Union, for example, at the expense of others, and there was very much a growth imperative behind uh, communist objectives, etc. So this is a new point in history where you can say, we've actually had enough economic growth, we've had enough privatization of profits, we've built the infrastructure through capitalism that we need, a la the internet to actually do things in a very connected way while simultaneously being decentralised. But that we understand now the provision of private profits drives inequities that can't be, um, can't be counteracted by any amount of philanthropy of tax or taxation because if it was enough, then you wouldn't see any incentives for business. And as a result of that, as a result of the increasing inequities that we've seen, I mean, 80% of the world's population lives in countries where inequities are growing, financial inequities. And the key here is that financial inequity leads to status envy. Status envy leads to increases in consumption. And that's the consumption that we're facing at the moment. Those increases are the things that are actually driving so many of our sustainability woes around the world. So the trick is to actually look at a model which shifts from a private profit incentive to a public profit incentive or to one which doesn't have any ownership associated with it and actually understands that the not-for-profit model can be wonderfully creative. Look at BRAC, for example, the world's biggest not-for-profit. Uh, 120,000 employees, um, works across the health education area. It, has, uh, it services over um, a million people and it's because it runs commercial enterprises, 80 or 90% of its income as a not-for-profit is gained from commercial enterprises, a dairy, uh, they've got uh, um, handicraft stores around the place. And so this is the new model of not-for-profit, not-for-profit enterprise, not-for-profit 2.0, where people start to realise, hey, we can run successful businesses as not-for-profit, but the inbuilt wisdom here is that the money is actually being returned into the system. It's not driving inequity. 
And the last kicker, important kicker of this model to think about is that as Deloitte uh, showed last year in an important report on the topic of profit, over the last 40 years, profit margins have been decreasing uh, for big corporations. And that's a, a factor of a whole lot of different things. And as peak oil hits and as resources cost more, my understanding is that those margins are going to continue. And as debt grows, those margins are going to continue to reduce. Now, the interesting thing here is not-for-profits to run sustainably don't have to make a profit. They just have to break even, pay wages, etc., continue to do their services. And with the ability of now you might start to see how the pieces from the beginning of our conversation fit together. With the ability of open innovation to actually be more innovative and the for-profit model often being associated with the proprietization of knowledge, we have that perfect storm where my prediction is that over the next 30, 40, 50 years, not-for-profit will actually become more competitive than for-profit business. And you'll actually see a natural shift, whether or not it's fast enough for, for sustainability in, in the way I'm explaining it, who knows, but you'll see a natural death of, of profit in terms of the provision of private profit within a capitalistic model that will therefore transcend and become a different model altogether in terms of its driving rationale. The, uh, the optimism that's there and, and the reasoning behind it is clear. So it's, a, it's not a uh, dream or a castle in the sky, it actually has reasoning under it which is quite fascinating. Although Thoreau said build your castles in the sky and then build the base under it if you have to do it that way too. Um, right. Let me close with uh, one, uh, one comment about something that you did in the past. You hold the world's record, Guinness Book of World Record, for the fastest uh, crossing of Australia. <laughs> I'd like to finish yeah. with that. Uh, so you crossed Australia on foot, uh, ran across the country. Uh, you have the world's record on that. Um, and you also raised a lot of money for a, a particular cause. Yeah, well, it's interesting you say that because the, the cause was the thing that got me into nanotechnology in part. It was the Fred Hollows Foundation, and they were the ones who... Uh, at the time, we're doing cataract surgery around the world. It was $400 or so to have an eye operation. And they came in uh, to actually get the intraocular lens produced by the big multinationals. They came in and created a lens for $7.50. They undercut through very important innovation the cost associated with basic uh, medical services. And so I loved that model because they then also um, set up the factories in Eritrea, in Nepal, that actually produce the lens themselves. So those places have an income. They were probably my first introduction to a not-for-profit that was running as a social enterprise. Um, so it's not fully donor-dependent, especially in those countries. And that's an interesting uh, return full circle to, to how I, I got into community uh, development and community innovation. It was probably through learning of models like the Fred Hollows Foundation's one and combining that with the fact that I spent 792 hours running across the country uh, with time to think and to process what was going on and I think perhaps to connect in, uh, as bold as it might sound, to connect in with the collective unconscious just for that little bit when you're delirious in the middle of a, a country on a hot day. Well, it's, uh, it's certainly uh, good to talk to you and to hear your stories and also your plans and uh, for post-growth. Um, appreciate your time. Uh, Donnie McLurkin. Thanks, Lance. Thanks, Lance. Cheers.